1. The Incarnation and Birth of Christ. Under this general heading several points deserve attention. a. The subject of the Incarnation. It was not the triune God but the second person of the Trinity that assumed human nature. For that reason it is better to say that the Word became flesh than that God became man. At the same time we should remember that each of the divine persons was active in the Incarnation, Matt, 120. Luke 1 verse 35, John 1 verse 14, Acts 2 verse 30, Romans 8 verse 3, Galatians 4 verse 4, Phil 2 colon 7. This also means that the Incarnation was not something that merely happened to the Logos, but was an active accomplishment on his part. In speaking of the Incarnation in distinction from the birth of the Logos, his active participation in this historical fact is stressed, and his pre-existence is assumed. It is not possible to speak of the incarnation of one who had no previous existence. This pre-existence is clearly taught in Scripture, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1 verse 1. I am come down from heaven, John. 638, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 who, existing in the form of God, counted not the being on an equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men, Phil 2 colon 6 7. But when the fullness of the time came God sent forth his Son, Galatians 4 verse 4. The pre-existent Son of God assumes human nature and takes to himself human flesh and blood, a miracle that passes our limited understanding. It clearly shows that the infinite can and does enter into finite relations and that the supernatural can in some way enter the historical life of the world. b. The necessity of the Incarnation. Since the days of scholasticism the question has been debated, whether the Incarnation should be regarded as involved in the idea of redemption, or as already involved in the idea of creation. Popularly stated, the question was, whether the Son of God would have come in the flesh even if man had not sinned. Rupert of Dutes was the first to assert clearly and positively that he would have become incarnate irrespective of sin. His view was shared by Alexander of Hales and Duns Scotus, but Thomas Aquinas took the position that the reason for the incarnation lay in the entrance of sin into the world. The Reformers shared this view, and the churches of the Reformation teach that the incarnation was necessitated by the fall of man. Some Lutheran and Reformed scholars, however, such as Ogender, Roth, Dorner, Langer, Van Oosterse, Martinson, Ebrard, and Westcott, were of the contrary opinion. The arguments adduced by them are such as the following, such as stupendous. Fact as the incarnation cannot be contingent, and cannot find its cause in sin as an accidental and arbitrary act of man. It must have been included in the original plan of God. Religion before and after the fall cannot be essentially different. If a mediator is necessary now, he must have been necessary also before the fall. Moreover, Christ's work is not limited to the atonement and his saving operations. He is mediator, but also head, he is not only the arch, but also the telos of creation. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 45 to 47, f. 1 colon 10, 21 23, 5 colon 31, 32, Colossians 1 verses 15 to 17. However, it should be noted that Scripture invariably represents the Incarnation as conditioned by human sin. The force of such passages as Luke 19 verse 10, John 3 verse 16, Galatians 4 verse 4, 1 John 3 verse 8, and Phil 2 colon 5-11 is not easily broken. The idea, sometimes expressed, that the Incarnation in itself was fitting and necessary for God, is apt to lead to the pantheistic notion of an eternal self-revelation of God in the world. The difficulty connected with the plan of God, supposed to burden this view, does not exist, if we consider the matter subspecie eternitatis. There is but one plan of God, and this plan includes sin and the incarnation from the very beginning. In the last analysis, of course, the incarnation, as well as the whole work of redemption was contingent, not on sin, but on the good pleasure of God. The fact that Christ also has cosmical significance need not be denied. But this too is linked up with his redemptive significance in F1 colon 10, 20 23, Colossians 1 verses 14 to 20. See, the change affected in the incarnation. When we are told that the Word became flesh, this does not mean that the Logos ceased to be what he was before. As to his essential being, the Logos was exactly the same before and after the incarnation. 
the verb agenito in John 1 verse 14, the word became flesh, certainly does not mean that the logos changed into flesh, and thus altered his essential nature, but simply that he took on that particular character, that he acquired an additional form, without in any way changing his original nature. He remained the infinite and unchangeable Son of God. Again, the statement that the Word became flesh does not mean that he took on a human person, nor, on the other hand, merely that he took on a human body. The word sarx, flesh, here denotes human nature, consisting of body and soul. The word is used in a somewhat similar sense in Romans 8 verse 3, 1 Timothy 3 verse 16, 1 John 4 verse 2, 2 John 7, comp fill 2 colon 7. d. The incarnation constituted Christ one of the human race. In opposition to the teachings of the Anabaptists, our confession affirms that Christ assumed his human nature from the substance of his mother. The prevailing opinion among the Anabaptists was that the Lord brought his human nature from heaven, and that Mary was merely the conduit or channel through which it passed. On this view his human nature was really a new creation, similar to ours, but not organically connected with it. The importance of opposing this view will be readily seen. If the human nature of Christ was not derived from the same stock as ours, but merely resembled it, there exists no such relation between us and him as is necessary to render his mediation available for our good. e, the incarnation affected by a supernatural conception and a virgin birth. Our confession affirms that the human nature of Christ was conceived in the womb of the blessed Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Ghost, without the means of man. This emphasizes the fact that the birth of Christ was not at all an ordinary but a supernatural birth, in virtue of which he was called, the Son of God. The most important element in connection with the birth of Jesus was the supernatural operation of the Holy Spirit, for it was only through this that the virgin birth became possible. The Bible refers to this particular feature in Matt 1 colon 18-20, Luke 1 verses 34 and 35, Hebrews 10 verse 5. The work of the Holy Spirit in connection with the conception of Jesus was twofold, 1. He was the efficient cause of what was conceived in the womb of Mary, and thus excluded the activity of man as an efficient factor. This was entirely in harmony with the fact that the person who was born was not a human person, but the person of the Son of God, who as such was not included in the covenant of works and was in himself free from the guilt of sin. 2. He sanctified the human nature of Christ in its very inception, and thus kept it free from the pollution of sin. We cannot say exactly how the Holy Spirit accomplished this sanctifying work, because it is not yet sufficiently understood just how the pollution of sin ordinarily passes from parent to child. It should be noted, however, that the sanctifying influence of the Holy Spirit was not limited to the conception of Jesus, but was continued throughout his life, John 3 verse 34, Hebrews 9 verse 14. It was only through this supernatural conception of Christ that he could be born of a virgin. The doctrine of the virgin birth is based on the following passages of Scripture, Isaiah 7 verse 14, Matt 1 colon 18, 20, Luke 1 verses 34 and 35, and is also favored by Galatians 4 verse 4. This doctrine was confessed in the church from the earliest times. We meet with it already in the original forms of the apostolic confession, and further in all the great confessions of the Roman Catholic and Protestant churches. Its present denial is not due to the lack of scriptural evidence for it, nor to any want of ecclesiastical sanction, but to the current general aversion to the supernatural. The passages of scripture on which the doctrine is based are simply ruled out of court on critical grounds which are far from convincing, and that in spite of the fact that the integrity of the narratives is proved to be beyond dispute, and it is gratuitously assumed that the silence of the other New Testament writers respecting the virgin birth proves that they were not acquainted with the supposed fact of the miraculous birth. All kinds of ingenious attempts are made to explain how the story of the virgin birth arose and gained currency. Some seek it in Hebrew, and others in Gentile, traditions. We cannot enter upon a discussion of the problem here, and therefore merely refer to such works as Machen, the virgin birth of Christ, or, the virgin birth of Christ, sweet, the birth and infancy of Jesus Christ, cook, did Paul know the virgin birth? Knowing, the virgin birth. The question is sometimes asked, whether the virgin birth is a matter of doctrinal importance. Bruner declares that he is not interested in the subject at all. He rejects the doctrine of the miraculous birth of Christ and holds that it was purely natural, but is not sufficiently interested to defend his view at length. 
Moreover, he says, the doctrine of the virgin birth would have been given up long ago were it not for the fact that it seemed as though dogmatic interests were concerned in its retention. The Mediator, page 324. Bath recognizes the miracle of the virgin birth, and sees in it a token of the fact that God has creatively established a new beginning by condescending to become man. The Doctrine of the Word of God, page 556, Credo, pp 63ff, Revelation, pp 65f. He also finds in it doctrinal significance. According to him the sin inheritance is passed on by the male parent, so that Christ could assume creatureliness by being born of Mary, and at the same time escape the sin inheritance by the elimination of the human father, Credo, pp 70f. In answer to the question whether the virgin birth has doctrinal significance, it may be said that it would be inconceivable that God should cause Christ to be born in such an extraordinary manner, if it did not serve some purpose. Its doctrinal purpose may be stated as follows, 1. Christ had to be constituted the Messiah and the Messianic Son of God. Consequently, it was necessary that he should be born of a woman, but also that he should not be the fruit of the will of man, but should be born of God. What is born of flesh is flesh. In all probability this wonderful birth of Jesus was in the background of the mind of John when he wrote as he did in John 1 verse 13. 2. If Christ had been generated by man, he would have been a human person, included in the covenant of works, and as such would have shared the common guilt of mankind. But now that his subject, his ego, his person, is not out of Adam, he is not in the covenant of works and is free from the guilt of sin. And being free from the guilt of sin, his human nature could also be kept free, both before and after his birth, from the pollution of sin. f. The incarnation itself part of the humiliation of Christ. Was the incarnation itself a part of the humiliation of Christ or not? The Lutherans, with their distinction between the incarnatio and the exinanitio, deny that it was, and base their denial on the fact that his humiliation was limited to his earthly existence, while his humanity continues in heaven. He still has his human nature, and yet is no more in a state of humiliation. There was some difference of opinion on this point even among Reformed theologians. It would seem that this question should be answered with discrimination. It may be said that the Incarnation, altogether in the abstract, the mere fact that God in Christ assumed a human nature, though an act of condescension, was not in itself a humiliation, though Kuiper thought it was, De Christo II, pp 68ff. But it certainly was a humiliation that the Logos assumed, flesh, that is, human nature as it is since the fall. Weakened and subject to suffering and death, though free from the taint of sin. This would seem to be implied in such passages as Romans 8 verse 3, 2 Cor. 8 9, Phil 2 6, 7, 